Perfect. So now it should be working. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry about that. Oh, no, you're good. Still okay? Okay. Um, okay, so, if so uh, some of you are master students, some of you are uh, PhD students, so the basic thing is you need data to really do your study. So, um, again, looking at what, what data can I get about Lyft and Uber, and, you know, this is from several years ago, so, and we still have the same struggle of trying to get data to really do some research and analysis on it. So, um, the decision that, that I made with my advisor is that I was going to become an Uber driver, or Uber and Lyft driver, to do what we call in the research science an ethnographic study. So, you actually dive into some, some sort of uh, the system to try to understand better what's going on. So the idea was to collect data. Uh, actually, even without talking to the passengers, I knew from where to where I was picking up people, what time of the day, and, and that sort of uh, information that is just basic information. I collected weather data um, and, and from where to where I was going. Um, and then I added a survey, so I asked the passengers to take a survey so I can combine those two methodologies, two, two sets of data to try to come up with some some, some basic analysis of what was going on in the Colorado region, the Denver, Boulder, suburban area uh, for the study. So through the process of trying to test this out, because I didn't know if I was going to be able to do it, I don't know if my, I was going to get the approval of the IRB and the approval of my wife. So, <laughs> um, so then, um, so I did a, a, a probably about 50, 100 rides just to test it out. Uh, to, to see how people were going to receive it, what data collection methods I was going to use. Um, and one of the things that I realized is that people love to talk about transportation, how it was wrong with transportation, how to fix it. Uh, every, everybody, uh, uh, that wasn't an issue for me. The issue was to kind of like make that icebreaker, that first conversation and, and feeling that. So what I ended up doing is just put it inside around the car and, and allow so I had a tablet, so I bought a tablet, I bought a domain, and then I put signs in the car. So that way it triggers the conversation and it make it so much easier to collect the data. Um, so I have the Lyft and the Uber driver apps, and then I have the Google Maps, and then I use my tracks just to double check that the GPS and the distances and travel times were, were correct. So um, at the end of the study, because I have to get the, the IRB approval rate, I probably end up doing more than 600 rides in total from the day I sign up to the day I, I was done. Um, but this is for the dissertation. This is what I use. And as you can tell, we, we get, we're, it's, for us it's, as researchers, it's really hard to get a good response rate, and sometimes we have to pay money just to get a, a few percentage. So this way, you can actually get paid for them to respond at a higher rate. So it, it, I will encourage, uh, and my joke is I'm trying to recruit more students and more people to do this in different places and, and, a, and a bigger picture to try to understand. But um, just, just so uh, m some of the basic results that, that we went through it, uh, this is a, a paper that was published last year where um, one of the things that, that, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the term that heading, how many of you know what deadheading is? Um, so I'm surprised only a few of you. So deadheading comes from the taxi and the freight truck industry. So it refers when you're moving around without uh, being efficient. So moving around without moving a passenger or moving around without cargo. So sometimes because of the system itself, you have to do that. So a lot of times um, when the, the boat, the, so if the boat pick up some cargo here and it's taking it somewhere, uh, it drops up somewhere, and sometimes it has to come back empty or go around. So this is something that I start looking at. It's like, okay, what percentage of all the driving that the taxis? And it goes back to the question of, you know, looking at the taxis around. And you can see it here uh, with the Uber, with the Lyft, with the taxis. Think about, like, every next time you see a car, look at it, how many passengers there are. And if there's none, that's what that heading is. Um, and the easiest way for me to explain this is the, the example of the NFL player. I don't know if you guys heard of this. But so there was a, a game that the NFL player, uh, they were taking a flight from Chicago to Buffalo. Uh, he missed the plane. He couldn't get into the plane. So what he did is order an Uber. 
And the media was all over about, you know, like what kind of talk, talk they did during the ride, what relationship they formed. My first question is, what is that driver going to do after he drops him off? And I mean, my guess, I, I, I actually didn't find out, but my guess is that he drove all the way back from Buffalo to Chicago by himself. So that's kind of uh, the biggest dead heading that I have experienced. Give him a big check or something. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Um, so in, in terms of the technology itself, uh, when we look at you know the, the full, um, so think about a, a Uber or Lyft driver, so or a taxi driver. So he lives somewhere, uh, commutes somewhere to start the day to be driving for Uber and Lyft. So he turns on the app on. Um, he's going to either stay put or just look around for a ride. Um, traditional taxi cabs have to travel around just to pick up. So you know there's some certain distance there. Then you get the right request, and then once you get the right request, you have to go pick up that passenger. So you pick up the passenger, you give the ride, and then do that through your shift, and then at the end of your shift, um, then you, you log out and go home. So of all of these, that heading is the, the red pieces, uh, where the passenger side is just this piece of, of the puzzle. Um, there has been some studies before there from an Uber, um, Uber data, um, so when I did the Lear review, there was the only thing that, that was around that um, they, they tried to compare Uber to, to taxi and they, they were more efficient, which is what I found through with, with the data. Uh, later on, I, I, we did some analysis with some ride asking data, so it was 1.5 million rides. And it was within the, so I feel pretty confident that, that this is the spectrum that we look, but this is just general. Uh, you know, things are different in New York than in, in Colorado. Things are different in the suburbs, the, the, the dense area. Things are different uh, during times of the day where you have high demand and, and, and low supply. Those sort of things that analysis that, that it is thinking about ahead of the game. And I'll show a slide on what we're thinking about with this optimization. It's an optimization prong. Um, but so for every mile that, that, that you are with the passengers, about 0 0.69 to 0.96 that you're without a passenger. So it's about 41 to 49 of the, the total BMT. Uh, why is this important? One of the other things that we talk about is, uh, have you guys heard the term SOV? So anybody? So, we, so the single occupancy vehicle, and a lot of planners and transportation organizations worry about it because that's what creates the most congestion. So it's the single occupancy vehicle. Uh, so one thing I, that I also collect was the number of passengers that were per ride, uh, which in, in average, when you do it per mile, is about 1.3. Uh, when you compare that to, to the data that we have in Colorado, it's, it was about average or, or around 1.4, it was what, what some of the numbers that, that the, re, the modelers gave me that, that was to compare that. So it was kind of similar. But the, so the one thing with that heading that, that I think is, is, is important to point out is when you have the zero miles that you're without a passenger, then that rate goes to 0 0.78. So nowadays, we're not going to worry just about SOV. We're going to have to worry about ZOV, which is a zero occupancy vehicle. Um, so, so the idea with, with the deadheading minimization or that type of analysis is how we can lower these and increase these to have a better approach so we can get this at a rate of 1.5 or 1.8 or so on. And this is where you know, we talk a lot about shared mobility, pooling, and so on. So those are kind of like the benefits that we, can, we should be striving for, but we need research on how to do that uh, a little more often. Um, in terms of more replacement, so in the survey questions, there were there were three ba three. Uh, I break it out by three. So one was on on that specific ride that they were doing. So three purpose, from where to where, uh, what will they have done? Uh, there were general questions about how do they usually get around? Are they usually drivers? Are they usually multimodals? Um, and then the, the third one was on demographics. Um, so for these, this is kind of points out like of all of those rides that we did, what was the percentage that I did, what was the percentage that, you know, the person will have drive along, which is, is a decent amount. Um, but also there's ones that are replacing modes that are more sustainable. And this is, again, what might create some congestions and so on. Uh, and how, how does it make sense? So everything that you've been doing in transportation planning, all this utility idea, doesn't make sense, you know, because public transport is very cheap. So if you talk about cost, 
I mean, obviously Uber is more expensive than any public transit. So there has to be something else that makes it to be ex out quite on Wall Street too. Yeah. So how do you calculate, or how do you factor in the cost when you talk about this kind of remote scale? Yeah, and that's that's something that we look into. So right now we have a project in looking at the utility mo model. Um, so one thing in in a lot of these, what happened is that the and actually the Uber and Lyft cost nowadays is not the true cost of what these these companies are. It's, it's actually being subsidized at a high level. But even even lower income people, um, a lot of these these substituting from public transportation is because the service didn't wasn't offered during those times. So even the people that work uh, in, in, so again, this is in the Denver regional area. Um, public transportation is not as robust as you have it here. So we're talking about different pictures here. Um, people work in the housekeeping industry. They get off at one, two, three in the morning off, and they have to get home somehow. Public transportation is not available, so these services come into play. But that uh, doesn't mean that they are exchanging public transport with Uber. I mean, that the, the mode is not available. I mean, that's a different well, sort of more choice model. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I guess that wasn't what I was going to point out. Is a lot of those initial rights were substituted from that taxis. Makes sense, but but you know. but but so so for for public transport, let's say um, if you can get somewhere that is in 10 minutes and it costs you um, I don't know $17 where in public transportation it's it takes you 25 30 minutes but it costs you five eight dollars like those kind of the that that's where you have to play around with the utility model on time and cost so cost is just one component I mean, just leave the discussion now in New York Times so the cost of subway ride is 270 if you make the subway ride two dollars, so two seventy-five to the two, uh, then you don't have to do anything. You will pay all the MTA bills, okay? And then there's a huge um, backlash against that. You're increasing the cost of subway rides by twenty-five cents. It's very difficult. People say they cannot afford it. So now here you're talking about two seventy-five to eight dollars. Well, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just giving an example, and again, won't no, I'm, and I'm not challenging what you're saying, but yeah. so are these pivot questions or real questions? No, the, the, this is actually what they will have done. So, uh, let's so say they have done what they have done. What they, the, what the person say, stated, what they will have done, or what? So the, there's a problem with the pivot questions. Like people are saying this. So so let me let me let me go through because uh, you you that issue I tried to resolve it with more recent data and I will show you in a second. Um, so so for the study, it, the, when you compare you know the different modes, the amount of miles that is replaced and so on, um, is about eighty three point five for the the set that that we're comparing what they will have done and what they were doing with with right hailing. Um, so. This paper was just published. I can send you guys the link or the paper if you're interested. Um, and we're trying to go uh, again with, with new data sets to try to, to look at these in different areas. Um, in terms of parking, uh, so this was another paper that was just accepted for publication. Um, you know, as I was saying, with the different modes, uh, some of them will have been driven either by their own car. Um, either car rental, if people were out of town, car sharing or carpooling. Uh, so it's trying to look at from where to where were they going, and a lot of these were um, from the airport or even hotel places. So, so maybe thinking about how some of these analyses can help us. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the ATE, I mean ITE ma parking manual. So trying to, depending on the type of of uh, of Resident, if it's residence or commercial or the type of, of land that is being developed, what are the parking rates? And there's a good conversation across the nation to try to remove the parking minimum that a lot of locations trying to impose in some developers. Um, interestingly, like after people are saying, um, I choose to take a Uber or Lyft instead of driving myself, um, the first reason was going out and drinking. So a lot of time it's just uh, uh, allow me just to get an extra drink or not have to worry about driving. 
But parking being difficult, and especially in urban places, was uh, kind of the second top reason. Um, there was some more recent research on this from other uh, people uh, around the nation, and it, co it goes to the, the same, the same um, thoughts. So one of the things that we realized is that a lot of those trips came from the airport. Um, go ahead. On the previous slide, was driving, you would drive your own car, or is that taking an Uber? What is driving going to be? So you will have driven your own car. So you will have either rented a, rented a car if you're away, or using car to go or the seat car, or um, driven your own car, yeah. So um, airports are one of the easy, kind of in, in the Colorado region, decision shifting points, because parking is, it's a little more expensive at the airport. And the time that it takes from, from the parking location to the terminal, uh, sometimes it can be up to 25, 30 minutes. So when you look at this graph of the one, one time is the time to cruise around to park, and then uh, the other piece of it is the walking to your destination. So we call it in the model the egress times. So because in some of these locations it's pretty high, um, that, that's what is happening. So, uh, we compare what it will have, to the total cost of, you know, if you were going to drive um, compared to what, what is the cost of, of the trip in an Uber or Lyft. Uh, and then the driving time compared to the, the ride hailing time. So uh, what it we try to show here is that people are willing to pay just to avoid parking. Um, again, this is for those specific trips that parking was stated as a, 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 a reason. So in the Denver region, what, what is trying to help with some of the developers and the land use and, and the model is trying to rethink about all the parking stock that there is in the, in the city and how to use for other purposes, like housing is a big issue and, and so on, so reimagining those things. One thing that, that I actually um, end up doing, and we, we didn't have the intent initially, but people want to know like how much Uber and Lyft drivers make and how much I was making and so on. So because I collect such a detailed information, um, and you know, Uber and Lyft promote, the, you, you can make, you know, I, I, early on the day I saw a, a, time, a, a New York Times article, I think, or it was Forbes, that a driver was making 100K a year. I was like, really? So, so it's like I try to look at, you know, use the detailed data um, where, where I knew exactly how much the passenger pay. Um, so the other thing that, that I'm trying to show here is we, a lot of times the model says, oh, in the future, AVs is going to cost $1 per, per mile or so on. But it doesn't follow like a specific set number or a linear, um, a, a linear uh, analysis, and it's because the initial cost of a lot of the Uber and Lyft rides are high, so it follows uh, this kind of trend where we can estimate, you know, some of the longer rides to the airport and whether or not that's beneficial for for the driver um, to to drive those longer distances. So what I did here is for every single ride that I have given in my in time period, um, I calculated what some of the rates that Uber and Lyft have used, because they, they have sometimes they use it based on not the time that you're working, but just the time that you're with a passenger or the time that uh, sort of thing. So to make it clear, like uh, in sometimes, yeah, you can make, you know, 20, $35 per hour when you don't take into account like a lot of the deadheading time or the commuting time or, or those sort of things. Uh, so it, it's important to, to make the difference there. And the other thing that, that a lot of discussion isn't happening is about the expenses. So one thing is the, the gross earnings versus the net earnings. So what we did here is look at three different scenarios of how much uh, expenditures per mile there is. Um, so the, the issue here is that when you take into account those ex expenses, um, it's more in the, in the minimum wage range. And sometimes a lot of the drivers don't even make minimum wage. And that's part of the issue where Uber and Lyft might have a lot of problems with the retention rates because they are pretty low. Um, so after I finished my dissertation, um, I joined NREL. And what I was talking about is the mobility system analysis. And what I would like to do here, how are we doing in time? OK. Um, I'll probably spend probably 10 or 15 more minutes. Um, so the, the DOE, the Department of Energy, created this new program called the SMART. So it's uh, a cross-lab, uh, multi-year program 
where what we do is in different areas of research, we try to look at what's happening. Um, I mainly work in the urban science, so thinking about cities, and the mobility decision science team. So the mobility decision is thinking about the human behavior and how a lot of these things are, are changing. Uh, so the question, you know, is you know, how is this right handling specifically and even other modes is impacting mobility and energy use? So what I try to do here is just look, uh, uh, point out the main factors that influence energy use from, from these services. So one thing that, that I didn't do before and I'm doing right now is looking at the vehicle type. So what kind of vehicles the Lyft and Uber drivers are using? Um, are they more fuel efficient? Are they EV penetration at a higher rate than the general population? Which is some of bigger opportunities that we have because these are longer range uh, vehicles used. Um, and cities like Seattle is really investing heavily on infrastructure for EVs and how to incentivize Uber and Lyft drivers to use EVs. And the companies itself have made announcement on, on trying to move into this direction as well. So just, uh, this is a very preliminary data that we got from uh, Populous, uh, Regina Clelo. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with her. She did some of the, the work on the um, report on UC Davis. Uh, so we, we're working together in looking at some of these. Uh, so what I'm trying to show here is from, from that data set of 742 drivers, uh, compare the type of vehicles that they use uh, to the general population. So we use uh, 271 million the pulp, from the Pulse data. And we see, you know, and, and it, it makes sense. If you're going to drive for Uber or Lyft, you, you try to, you know, use a more fuel efficient vehicle or, or EV vehicle. Um, but sometimes you'll be surprised. You can get a ride in a Hummer, and I don't even know how they make money on those, you know, on those vehicles. Um, this was some more detailed data with the ride Austin fleet. So remember the 1.5 million, million rides that we talked about it. Um, so this is just to the 7% scale. Everything else is gasoline, but, you know, because the plug-in hybrid electric and uh, EVs and, and are, are pretty low rate, but it's still it's almost double when you compare to the general population the amount of, of EV or, or plug-in hybrid battery electric and plug-in uh, um, hybrid electric. So again, th this is kind of like the positive side of, of the picture of trying to minimize the energy use. Um, thinking about mode shifts, um, both long-term and short-term, um, I mentioned some of the three replacement, um, but then uh, one thing that we start exploring further, and this goes back to the question about the, the, the shifting from, from other modes and, and whether or not they are a state preference or is, is it other type of data. Um, because airports have been able to implement a TNC fee, um, so what I decided to do and proposed to the team is actually collect data through public requests to the airports um, to give us the revenue data on TNCs and all different modes. And what we found here, and this is something that actually they are worried about right now, uh, because a lot of the revenue coming to an airport is from parking. So people driving there and parking there. Uh, what we found consistently across some of the initial airports that we analyzed is that after, so the X is the introduction of Uber and Lyft in that city. So parking revenues per passenger, so normalized per passenger, uh, were always going upwards. After the entrance, there was a peak, and from that point, it's always going downwards. Uh, Austin is an interesting case because Uber and Lyft left and come back for legal reasons, so you can actually see those signals in, in the data. So it's a very interesting uh, type of data. We also see it in Denver. So this kind of uh, drop here and, and changes was from uh, the introduction of the rail line going to the airport. So it actually was uh, present on the data too. Um, so we published a report on that, I think it's here, so I can send you guys that too if you're interested. But uh, in the second set of, of data collection, uh, we actually were more specific this time and we wanted to get transactions per mode. Um, so it was a little tricky because the transit data is, is usually not collected by airport by the transit authority. So what, we, what you can see here is the transaction data per normalized for air passengers. Um, um, in, in, in all the, so the blue is the TNC entry and how many of those 
transactions for air passengers are changing. And for, um, re oh, I forgot to update it because I got some new data on Denver. And so this is Seattle. I think this is Denver, San Francisco. Um, so, so this kind of allows us to help build that uh, model to, to to really try to understand, you know, because we're having different airports, we have different um, uh, costs for where people are going. So we're trying to get the uh, matrices from for that city and where people are going to and from the airport, and try to build this information into that model. Um, so. I hope this kind of data, like for, for Seattle, you can see how, how that has changed. And Seattle is one of the best in the nation in terms of getting uh, better transit ridership. And even for them, uh, the replacement with, with these other modes, um, it, it, it's, it's very interesting. And although Seattle has no has as much um, uh, TNC penetration as some of the other airports that you can, you can look in here. In, the, in terms of the long term, you know, there is these premises for Uber and Lyft say, oh, car ownership models are going to change and so on. Uh, so that's another thing that, that we're trying to analyze right now. Uh, so whether or not, you know, the, the people that drive all the time, whether or not they're going to change some car ownership models or the ones that have a car but decide depending on the type of trip, uh, whether or not they're going to, you know, maybe stop using the car or... The, you know, the, 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 the most people will, will, won't, won't change much. But, you know, the hope is that, you know, those drivers maybe don't have a car anymore and then become more like a multimodal with using some of this right sourcing here and there. Um, so those are kind of like the, the things that we're trying to look in the long term. But one thing that, that also I, I, I usually like to point out is that we don't, let, let's not forget about the drivers themselves um, because, you know, remember the, the growth that I was showing, and in order to, to provide that many rides, even in the U.S., you're talking about, about two, two, million, um, two, two to five million drivers that, that you have to, to look in the nation. And again, it continues to grow, and a lot of those drivers maybe didn't have a car before. Um, maybe that's a new set of people that um, maybe they didn't have a car, and now they're becoming more drivers for TNCs, but also for themselves. So it could be a mechanism for car ownership, which is more relevant in cities like in Colombia, in Bogota. They're, they're actually really worried about this because the car ownership is starting to increase, and that's what a lot of times create more, more congestion. So one thing is the promise for the passenger side, but we also shouldn't be forgetting about the, the driver side of, of the picture. Uh, just moving on with, with the quantity of travel, uh, this is something that, that we're thinking about is whether or not the, the length for with these modes are going to be shorter or if you don't own a car and the number of trips you make depending on the decisions you do in the long term. Um, pooling, um, again, I mentioned already the, the passengers per ride, how do we increase these? Um, and then for deadheading, I also already covered some of it. And this is relevant when we talk about AVs because, you know, AVs have to reposition themselves to either charge or locate themselves to try to pick up passengers and so on. Um, one thing I like to point out, and, and I know you guys, some of you are working on this, and, and I really want to explore this further. So if you guys have interest in it, we're trying to build uh, some, some proposals around this optimization. So the idea is for a city, um, what is the right number? What is the, the, the number that when we think about deadheading minimization, what, what is that ratio for the demand? Uh, what is the supply should be um, to, to try to minimize deadheading? Because even if you don't have a, enough, enough supply, if so even if you don't have enough number of drivers, for that driver, once you get a request, you have to go and pick up that passenger. So there's some travel that has to be done. So I think it's an optimization problem that we're trying to look at. Uh, we kind of explore a little bit with the right asking data, but we, we would like to add some more um, variables to that model and see if we can get uh, more data from, from other sources like DD. Uh, we're starting to explore that. I know New York has some, some data on this regard. So if any of you guys are interested in and want to, to put together some type of proposal or work around these, please let me know. Um, putting it all together, I mentioned the study on these. Uh, one thing about 
uh, why is important for BMT? Even for the drivers, they might drive less, but you actually end up getting a little higher BMT because of the deadheading issue. So again, why deadheading is so important. Um, thinking about the multimodals, there were some people for that, the, the study in the dissertation that, that got rid of the car, so move from a multimodal with a car to, to a, a no car, uh, but it's still all the three different groups for BMT went up, and it's because of this issue of, of deadheading, and I think that's why, why we want to work study this further. Um, this is another paper we have on, on the revise and resubmit. So with the write outs in data, what we try to look at is for all the different things that I mentioned, is how is energy really going up and down. Um, so for you know the potential for sharing rides, and for using the more efficient vehicles, it's not enough to all the other negative uh, for energy. So we estimated that it's a from a 41 to a 90 percent increase for the the ones the people that are using PNC services. Um, just final thoughts on I don't know if you guys have seen these uh, slides about you know the spice re required to transport 60 people in terms of efficiency and, and looking at the transport system. Uh, you know the car, the bus, and the bicycle. Um, it's pretty much the car, the Uber, and the autonomous vehicles is the same. It's still a car. Um, it could be more or less, and I think the big picture here is how many people are in that car or whether or not there's any people in that car. So if there's a lot of these that are empty and in, in dead heading, um, then we're actually in a worse situation. Or if we are able to actually increase that number and having more than uh, whatever amount we need to be, then we'll be in a, in a more or, or, or better scenario. So this, this kind of picture um, I developed with, with a designer and rail um, using you know basic engineering um, uh, numbers from the vehicles per hour per lane uh, and uh, different speeds and, and different vehicle occupancy for the bus, uh, the cars and the taxis and the system is let's say thinking if we were going to fill out this stadium and we provide even providing the same amount of space, uh, to all these different modes is how efficient you can move people. And this is very relevant in a city like New York where you have a lot of density and how you can really uh, design the streets for, for those type of modes. Uh, just to, to close it up, and I don't know how we're doing the times, um, I think. So this is kind of like um, some of the stuff that we're working on, that we want to do, uh, and so on. So that heading minimization, again, is how do we have a system and, and, and a network and simulate this, try to reduce the dead heading. Uh, the pooling incentives, um, I know UC Davis has a, a good program in policy, so it's thinking about, okay, how do we really make people to share more at a higher level? Um, there's some, some research around gamification or um, a lot of times when you take an Uber pool or a Lyft line, I don't know if you guys have used it, but you get the discount up front. So a lot of times what happens is you already say, yes, I'm getting the discount, and then you hate it once you get that additional passenger because you already got that discount up front. Uh, so I'm trying to convince some of the Uber and Lyft people to see if we can do some type, type of test on maybe that discount or give a small discount at the beginning but then try to match that at the time of happening and see if the, the rates improve or not. Um, again, the conversation with them is always like, great star, we go through the process, we're gonna share the data, do this, and it doesn't go anywhere. So um, that's what we really need to continue and, and see what ways we can, we can work with them. Um, in terms of infrastructure or technology, um, a lot of times, uh, do you guys know the way that we collect data on vehicle occupancy? So how many people per car? Uh, any guesses on how do we do this these days? So survey. Yeah, so surveys is one. They, they, so, so there are two main ones. Service is one. Uh, surveys is one. The second one, hiring the students just to sit in a corner and count people. Like... We're talking technology about AVs, like, and we can now develop technology to count cars in a, in a system. So that's something that, that we're working with cities or airports trying to see through some, let's say, video technology where uh, a drop-off and pickups, how many passengers are getting on and off the car, 
to try to get us or, or collect data at a higher level that we can compare different locations in different airports. Um, uh, Long-term behavioral decisions, again, it's about this car ownership and different models, whether or not it's going to work, uh, whether or not we're really going to shift. Um, what, what else? I, th I think that that's about it. I mean, I, I'm very interested in, in some other topics as policy, but with DOE, we try to get away from, from that. But we can do research on different type of um, uh, technologies or different type of infrastructure to see and allow us to see what happens. But with that, I'm, I'm going to just finish it. It looks like it was a good time. So let me focus on some uh, of the comment and the question. So you, you have a slide with the, with the number of people in the space. Uh, I mean, I, I always think that's a little bit, uh, it, it'd be a little silly to get these different countries. But to uh, just to follow up earlier uh, on the question of about the mode shift, mm -hmm. um, when, when you look, also look into like the uh, trip surface for for the retail, because I mean I, I can see that uh, for people taking public transit, uh, the fare might be low, but there are other costs associated with that. But at the same time, uh, as like for commute trips uh, to work mm -hmm. and so forth, I I feel that those would tend to be a lot more elastic if any stick with public transit for a whole week and that. So it seems to me that, uh, at, at least um, um, as a hypothesis, that most of those, those mode shifts uh, from public transit would be from people who might be taking uh, other infrastructure methods. Right? Yeah, so so that that's a good question. Again, I, I, I usually, I'm careful because the, the, this data set is so small, um, but so to make general assumptions from, from some of those. but. When I when I went deeper into the the conversations about you know the the replacing transit, a lot of time it was about saving time in regards to I don't have to leave my house like I can I have twenty extra minutes and thirty extra minutes and that was kind of like what I learned through that process and that was there was a recent uh, article on how in on UCLA campuses. They provide like uh, eleven thousand rides, something ridiculous. Where for students and and you know an Uber and Lyft trip is not cheap, but is is that a specific case? It's like well, I can get fifteen twenty extra minutes of sleep. So again, it's valuing the time for paying the the additional time. Um, so. So yeah, I'm, I, it's not the majority of it, but it's a, it's, a, it's a percentage of it that is happening. And when you look at the most share of a system, transit is, is, is very small. So any small number that you take from a very small percentage is, is going to show in, in the data as being more, more dramatically changed. Where let's say for BMT, uh, the numbers might, might show 83%, but in reality, it's not that much because the, the penetration of Uber and Lyft for BMT is only one, I don't think even 1% of the general BMT. So I think that's, that's where those, those type of conversation. And um, again, I, I think, so in the theoretical framework of, of mode shifts, there is the, I, I'm going to forget it one, the, the IAA assumption, um, the inter in, in, it's called I, 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 I. <laughs> so so my my understanding of the assumption is that you assume that that whatever entry of TNC um, is gonna take away proportionally to what the mode share was previously to the entrance but that assumption to me is is not right because if you have a good transit system um, if you have a higher level, I, I don't think you're going to take as much because just because of that assumption. So it's trying to, to, you know, how do we build build better models to take into account all of these different right, right. utilities? I mean that, that 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 assumption is 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 a, is an issue with the, the the set of models actually that we would be using mm -hmm. for these sorts of models um, as opposed to this. But 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 the actual real utility is. No, but uh, in the case with the, 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 the when you were conducting the survey, uh, you, you didn't uh, put 
so, so no, yeah, yeah. So three three purpose was there, and I can I can yeah I can share that the data too. Um, so. Um, so I'm putting because I have to. This was straight through uh, the Rocky Mountain UTC. So I have to put uh, a final paper, and that was uh, specifically in there because we were trying to show the three purpose. I, I don't have it in top of my head, but but I can share that later on. I think what's important is, I mean, as you said, samples are small, so the sampling becomes very important. So the examples you give, for example, uh, I mean. In, in their core, they're programmatic. You know? For example, somebody who's going to airport, that his purpose is very different than the commuter's purpose because I don't want to miss the airplane. I pay $1,500 to, to fly. Uh, the other thing, the example that college students, college students are not their computer. They're using their time and money. So he's seeing it more or less. Yeah, they'll do that. I believe you. They'll do that. <laughs> but that's not a good sampling strategy. So. But you have to be careful who you're sampling. The reason I'm saying this, uh, when the paper says 22% um, of transit trips will be moved from transit to Uber, right? Uh, no, no, that, so, that, so, that, so, so yeah. not, so no, that, that's, that's not what it's saying. What it's saying, of the people using Uber and Lyft, 22% come from transit, so it's, it's a different. So, so the, the agency and the government is using that uh, to, to make a policy decision, right? So they're saying, oh, I don't have to generic from transit anymore because nobody wants to transit. That's the Republican. Uh, and then Democrats are saying, oh, Uber is really terrible. Uh, let's put like a $5 or $10 tax on it. So uh, you have to be very careful. Qualify. I'm, not, I'm not questioning the yeah. result, but I'm questioning how people, policymakers are using this, yeah. especially this coming uh, from another yeah. government agency. Yeah. Because Neither is good. I mean, you know, there's obviously there's some effect, uh, but it might be people going to the airport, yeah. it might be tourists, or it might be college students. But I don't know if that represents no. the whole population. Yeah, no, and, and you're absolutely right. I, I think we have to be careful on how we show those results and interpret those results. And so there's a lot, there's both ways happening. So you're taking rides from Uber and Lyft, but are you also shifting the other one. And one of the things that we're trying, are actually trying to say in the model is that the utility of transit actually might increase because you have the backup option. So for those commuters, um, a lot of times, because um, you, you might be worried to, you go your commute in the morning, you might worry if you have to leave midday or if an emergency happening, like having an Uber in place that is not as expensive as a taxi or other modes, might actually increase that the transit system, and that's where, you know, uh, in in the economic models, uh, the, the assumptions are is, is in some models are the assumptions. So it's trying to say, you shouldn't be using some of these assumptions because I I've seen some papers where they use that assumption, and I think I think it's wrong for that specific type of model. Uh, but yeah, I mean, three purposes is 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 is. Um, is very important. That's why we're trying to build a model specifically for the airport, because even at the airport, you have three different type of travelers. Airports are usually one of the biggest employer in a region, um, so those are commuting trips. Um, but then you also have the passengers that are going either for business purpose, which a lot of times are reimbursed, so you're actually not paying for it, and you also have the the leisure trips that are actually coming from your your pocket money. So. What, that's what we think that airports, and especially because we're seeing this data, and 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 I think that we want to focus on some of that research in, in airports specifically for for that reason. Um, so a series of small comments and a big question too. The, the big question is going to be, what's your vision? Where, where do you see these services being in five or ten years? And the small comment um, to Joe's point about the stadium graphic. Um, what's missing from that graphic is not just flow, but also something about network accessibility, spatial coverage. Yeah. So maybe it would be a good student project to, to make that yeah. make a version that does incorporate network coverage, flexibility, et cetera. Um, to Khan's point about that, how would you have traveled if this mode wasn't available correctly? Um, I think there's, a, there's another further dimension that would be interesting to look at in the future, and that's, well, if this wasn't available, how bad would that alternative mode have been for you? So some measure of uh, consumer protest. Um, I don't, I'm 
last year was we lost in in London, um, night bus usage is down, and one of the suspects is is ride hailing. Um, it hasn't really been tackled, taken to ground yet, but that's one of the suspects of what's happening with specifically off peak buses <laughs> in London. Um, and yeah, question for you: wh wh What's your vision? Where do you see yeah. that going? Yeah, I have a great comments and. and the point of the graph, and I'm I'm with you. It's just not. This is you know. I haven't even published that. I just did it for fun with different and some numbers. Um, but the the big. I think the big vision is trying to understand or trying to help cities because I, I I get a lot of questions. Even Vancouver, who has put a stop on Uber and Lyft until they analyze it, has a, a big debate right now on like. Well, wh how should we regulate these? What what should we allow them? And I think uh, I'm I'm in the imp impression of not going in the extremes, uh, but also f like finding the right place for them. So I do believe that all of these modes have a place in a system. It's just figuring out what is the right market share. And I I tend to worry that if some things aren't in place, if we don't do the right research these companies might take off and some of the congestion issues that we have from uh, just just driving around might actually become even bigger. So is and that's an optimization problem, is trying to figure out what are the outcomes that you're trying to minimize. So in a lot of times I talk about minimizing that heading. Um, you know, the company might be thinking about maximizing profits. Um, the passenger might be thinking about minimizing my waiting time, minimizing my cost. So there's it, this, this is fascinating because there's just so many interests in play here, and it's, it's an optimization problem depending on what you're t trying to optimize for. Um, so I think in, in the research uh, schema is like what, what should be the right place for some of these services. Um, I'm, I'm excited, I mean, I, I tend to be positive and negative and optimistic, pessimistic, depending on the day and the new data that we're getting. But uh, one of the biggest things that, that I feel in terms of energy for us, which is kind of like the, the number one priority, is on the type of vehicles that we're using and replacing all the fleet that we have for more fuel efficient and um, even EVs. So, but, but then how do we support that? Once we decide like the market share of these services should be X amount, how do we support for drivers to get an EV um, so they can actually charge it and whether or not they can complete the shift into these vehicles. Uh, so I think that's, that's kind of like the big picture. And hopefully we learn some of the things through the research in these to actually inform what is coming, which is kind of like the bigger picture, which is going to be AV. Uh, I think the other thing, important thing that I usually tend to talk about is metrics, so having the right metrics. So VMT, you know, we worry about VMT going up, but Sometimes BMT is not bad, and it's trying to see. Well, w BMT provides mobility, so it's like, um, so in in at the lab, what we have developed is a metric called MEP, so the mobility energy productivity. So you think about in the numerator, um, so the mobility, so how much access you have to thing, how much movement you have around an area, and some of these services are providing that. Like people wouldn't have travel in some cases or you will have been able to get a job or get to that job uh, if these services were in place. So it's, it's in providing increasing mobility, but it also is, in, in so in the denominator, we think of the, the use of the energy use. So how much, so how much do we allow the system to, to, to use of energy for the right things that we're getting? So it's kind of like the ratio of positive over negative uh, in, this, in this case. I don't know if that's, and I will, so I will stick around um, if you guys want to talk some more, if you are interested in some of this research. I, I will also love to find out what some of you guys are doing and, and you know, 